Happy Super Bowl Sunday. Happy almost Valentine's Day. Happy Snow Day. It's good to see you guys this morning. Thank you for coming to worship with us this morning at Highland Heights Baptist Church. I'm Mike Sumi, the children's pastor here, if you don't know me. Uh, and I just wanted to welcome you guys, especially our first-time visitors. If you're visiting with us today, if you could, in the seat pocket in front of you is a card. And if you'll scan that, that card, there's a QR code on there, and that's going to give you connection to our connection card. Fill that out, and then we'll be in touch with you later on. Um, for all of you guys, we want to welcome you this morning. I have a, just a couple of announcements to share with you guys. Uh, first of all, our young adult ministry is having a love night, a love date night, something like that. Let me make sure I read this right. Uh, love, love night. Yes, young adult love night. There we go. Thank you. Uh, and they're going to fire me after this one time. I'm done. I'm no longer allowed ever to do this again. Uh, but uh, if you are looking for love, uh, young adults, come out. Uh, there's going to be... Um, there is going to be a date night there, and it's going to be lots of fun. There's going to be a pastor's panel speaking about relationships and dating. There are also going to be some fun games, including speed dating. I'm not sure how that works, but if you're interested, come on out. Uh, the second thing is our men's ministry is doing an event on March the 19th. Uh, it's uh, the first annual disc golf tournament. Uh, and if you would like to be part of that, the registration is currently open. Uh, if you'll go to hhbc.net backslash events, uh, you can register there and uh, you can find out all the information about that event as well as all the other events that are happening at our church. One last thing, I almost really got in trouble because I didn't mention giving. So let me, let me talk about that real quick. Um, how many of you have our new app? Raise your hand. Okay, look around. If they don't have the app, fuss at them beside you. Uh, get that app. Download that app because there's a great way to give on that app. Now it's connected to our new giving platform uh, that you can use. Also, you can still use that giving platform by going to hhbc.net backslash give, and uh, you can use it that way as well. Hope you guys are having a great morning. I'm going to ask Tim if he'll lead us now. So if you guys would stand, and stand with us and worship with us this morning. Let's go. Come on. You ready to worship? Yes. Hey, are you grateful for the victory we have in Jesus Christ? Come on, let's sing about that victory this morning.
up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grave. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior. To fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering. As the saints bow down, as your people sing, we will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that.
of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that yes the world will see that our god's day.
Amen. Where the Spirit of the Lord is. The Spirit of the Lord is in this place today. And as we think about this day, the day before Valentine's Day, we think about love and the love that our Father gave to us by sending His Son is the most powerful love we'll ever know. Today also we think about our spouse and the ones that we loved. And so I just want to take a moment as we go to this prayer time to invite you uh, to, to come pray with your spouse or the one that you love here at the altar or in your seats. If maybe you've lost your the one that you love and you, this prayer is open for you as well. Or for if you're looking for that special something, whatever it is, this prayer is for you. And as you make your way this morning, I just want to read this passage uh, from, uh, from, from 1 Corinthians, the love chapter. Just the most famous passage there. It says, If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and I have faith, I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body over to hardships that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where are all the prophecies, they will cease. Where are all the tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning, Father, and we thank you for that love that you sh shared for us by sending your son to die on a cross for our sins. Father, thank you that you loved us enough to do that. Father, we thank you for the love that you have allowed us to share with people here on earth, our spouse, our children, those that we love so much, God. God, I pray for the marriages in this room this morning that you would just bless uh, each one, Father, help them to grow stronger, grow closer to you. Father, comfort those who are, who are missing the one that they love. Father, those that are looking, whatever it may be, Father, that you would just... Send your powerful love to them this morning, God. We thank you for this church and for the opportunity we have to worship together. Father, we pray for Pastor Josh this morning as he leads us through, through your word, as Tim leads us through worship this morning. God, that you would be uplifted and glorified in all things. God, we love you and we praise you. We thank you most of all for Jesus. In his most precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship together. My strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comfort. My all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand. Come on, church, sing this out. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith. This gift of love and righteousness Scored by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid
stand. Again, are you thankful for the victory we have in Christ Jesus? Amen. Let me hear you. Just let me hear you say, praise the Lord. Amen. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. Amen. Amen. In this world, we will have trouble. There's no if about it. We will have trouble. But we fight from victory, not for victory. Amen. Amen. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for the victory that you gave us so long ago by going to that cross, the grave, and rising up victorious, defeating death, sin, and the grave. God, we are grateful for the sacrifice that you made in sending your son to this earth for us so we could be in relationship with you. Lord, this morning as we open up your word, God, we're excited to continue down the journey of the book of Acts. And God, we ask you just to, Lord, just make things new and fresh to us this morning as we read scripture that we've probably already read before. God, let your spirit move and work in this place. Continue to move and work. And God, may we allow your spirit to work in our hearts, our lives this morning. So that when we go through your scripture, we're not just sitting back listening to Pastor Josh on the stage, but we are listening as your word is preached this morning and allowing your spirit to move and work in us, to bring to the surface, bring to light those things in our lives that we're just hanging on to tightly, that are prohibiting a full relationship with you. God, I pray that, God, we'll be convicted this morning. God, God, work in my life, work in my heart. Show me those things that I need to work on, that I need to get rid of that are holding me back from being a fully devoted, fully committed follower of you. Father, I thank you for what you've done in this service, how your spirit is present and moving. And God, I give you glory and thanks for what you're going to continue to do in the rest of it. In your precious and matchless name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'm so excited to be in Acts this morning like I am every single week right now. God's just been speaking so much through this marvelous book of how the early church was, was birthed. And today I, I think is going to be no different. Uh, but I want you to think about something. We just uh, concluded singing a, a particular hymn. I, I love that hymn on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And, and we're reminded... We're reminded of the fact that in and of myself, in and of my own strength, in and of my own position, in and of my own will, that when trials come, that when persecution is faced, I'm not enough. That it's only on the foundation that is laid by the Savior that I have any hope of standing. Let me ask you a question. I might date myself a little bit uh, here, but, but how many of you remember when uh, the album Jesus Freak was released uh, back in the 90s, right? DC Talk album Jesus Freak. Well, there was a book that actually came out uh, shortly after that album, and it was basically my generation's Fox's book of martyrs. And so what this book was, it was a compilation of compelling stories of men and women who stood and took a stand for the faith once delivered to all the saints. In other words, this was uh, compelling stories of men and women who even when staring in the face the certainty of death chose to stand for Jesus rather than to bow to the false idols or the rulers of this world. And so as we're looking at the book of Acts, we're faced with a story of uh, such a, a time as is being described here. We're faced with a story of the apostles taking a stand and we're faced with just a cavernous question. And it's this, how would I stand in the face of such things? Let's read God's word this morning. Acts chapter four, beginning in verse one, it says this, now, while they were speaking to the people, just to catch you up in case you missed last week, the uh, apostles, Peter and John, on their way to prayer, 
uh, at the temple were walking by a crippled man who had been crippled all his life. He had never taken a single step before. The crippled man was there begging for change, and he was asking people who were going by if they would donate to help out the cause. And so you have Peter and John who are walking by the crippled man, and uh, they turn to him, they say, look at me. And he looks to them expecting to get some change to help him get through life just a little bit better. And Peter replies, uh, silver and gold we do not have, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And taking him by the hand, he launches the crippled man to his feet. And now the crippled man, for several hours now, at this point in Scripture, has not only been walking, but has been running, has been leaping, has been dancing, has been singing, has been worshiping, and has been giving God glory. And so what we're seeing in Acts chapter 4 is taking place right on, chap, uh, on, on top of Acts chapter 3. And so this is what it says, while they were still speaking to the people, as the people were asking Peter and John and the crippled man, how on earth did this happen to you? It says in the midst of that, the priest, the captain of the temple police, and the Sadducees confronted them. That's an aggressive word. The, the priest and the, the, or the police of the temple and the Sadducees go to confront Peter, John, and the crippled man because they did not like what was taking place. It says, because they were annoyed. I love that word. Because they were annoyed that they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they seized them and took them into custody until the next day, since it was already evening. But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of those men who had believed has come to about 5,000 during this time. Let's go ahead and pray this morning. Father God, we pray that your spirit would empower us, that it would change us, that it would illuminate your word, that we, your people, would be challenged by it, and that we, might, your people, might draw near to Jesus so that we, your people, might be able to stand in the day of hardship and the day of trial and the day when the evil one attacks, and the day of persecution. We know we're not immune from these things, but these are things that are normative to all people who walk by faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. So I have shared this phrase before, so it's a phrase for many of you that should not be new, but it's a phrase that I, I grew to love down when I was in New Orleans. It was a phrase one of my evangelism professors used to us. In other words, it's a phrase that I've held on to for a number of years, and it's a phrase that I've seen ring true over and over and over and over and over again. And here's the phrase that I want to share with you at the onset of thinking about this passage this morning. It's this. That spiritual activity breeds spiritual activity. That spiritual activity breeds spiritual activity. In other words, when God is on the move in his church, as we've seen him on the move here at Highland Heights, we can count on, we can bet on if we were betting people, right? We can absolutely with assurance know that the evil one is going to come against God's people when God's people are moving with the Spirit of God himself. Don't miss this. I want you to hear this, church. I wouldn't be a good pastor if I didn't go ahead and give you the warning about this. That the natural outworking of Acts chapter 2... In other words, the natural outworking of the Spirit falling upon His church. The natural outworking of the gospel being proclaimed with great power. The natural outworking of people in the community coming to saving faith in Jesus Christ like we see in Acts chapter 2. The natural outworking of Acts chapter 3 where we see a crippled man who never walked before in his life brought to his feet, not by the strength of Peter's arm, but by the power of Peter's message, rise up and walk. The natural outworking of that, the natural outworking of the indwelling of the Spirit and the empowering of the church, the beauty of the gospel and the experience being cherished, the adoration and the praise of Jesus, the joyful unity and the compelling generosity that we see throughout these early chapters and acts. The natural outworking is not a position of power. It's not a position of popularity. It's not a position of prominence. It's not a position of health, wealth. It's a position of persecution. 
Don't miss that. The natural outworking of God moving in his church is Satan rising up against God's church. And there's a question that begs to be asked when we read passages of scripture like this. And it's how will you and I stand in the face of such things? How will we stand in the face of trials? How will we stand in the face of the flaming darts of the evil one? How will we stand in the face of persecution when it comes our way? When it comes our way. See, persecution in the work of the evil one is an inevitable element of all who hold to genuine Christian faith. In John chapter 15, verses 18 through 20, Jesus told his disciples this. He said, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. In other words, if if the world hated Jesus, and we're followers of Jesus, then the world might not like what we have to say about Jesus. Are you okay with that? He says, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as their own. If you go the world's way, if you do the world's things, if you praise what the world prays, if you seek what the world seeks, they'll love you. But you can't follow Jesus. However, Jesus said, because you are not of this world and I have chosen you out of it, the world will hate you show of hands anybody love being hated like this kind of stuff makes us more uncomfortable than speed dating in church (laughs) like you're going to talk about persecution oh man But Jesus said, remember the word that I have spoken to you. A servant is not greater than his master. And if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And if they keep my word, they're also going to keep yours. Jesus uses this a fortiori logic or rhetoric. It basically means what is true for the greater, what is true for Jesus, is also true for the lesser. The lesser being me and you. The principle of spiritual activity, bringing about spiritual activity, is found throughout the entirety of Scripture and especially in the teachings of Jesus. Let's take the Beatitudes just for an instant. You're like, the Beatitudes? Really, Josh? The Beatitudes? Like, that's comforting, right? Like, oh, wait. Let's check it out. Here's what it says, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3, beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, what's commonly called the Beatitudes. Jesus says this before a crowd of people. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God and what is the reward for all of this blessing and blessed are the persecuted because of righteousness blessed are the persecuted who have been made right with the father by the blood of the son for the kingdom of heaven is theirs don't miss what Jesus is saying See, one blessing compiles on the other blessings. Blessed are those who recognize their spiritual brokenness and their need for God. Blessed are those who grieve over their sinful state. Blessed are those who humble themselves before God and seek his forgiveness. Blessed are those who desire to please God above all else. Blessed are those who show mercy to others because they have been shown mercy. Blessed are those who seek peace and bring peace to others. And what is the result of all this blessing? Don't miss it. It's not fame, it's not wealth, it's not a happy life, it's not peace and prosperity. Jesus says the result of all these blessings is persecution. 
Jesus goes on to tell his disciples. He explains the Beatitudes beginning in verse 11. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and say false things about you, all kinds of evil against you because of me. They're not going to like you. They're going to slander you. They might call you hateful. They might call you bigoted. But you follow me, Jesus says. Therefore, be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets. That is how they persecuted me. And that is how, Jesus says, they're going to persecute you as well. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. He says, in fact, say those words with me again. In fact, that means I'm not lying to you. That means I'm not making this up. That means I I wish this wasn't so, but this is the truth regardless of how we feel about it. In fact, all, say that word with me again, all who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He says, get ready, Christian, because the road is rough. It's not one that's going to be easy, but you follow me. Pastor, theologian, author, and martyr during the Holocaust, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, wrote, suffering is the badge of every true Christian. Martin Luther, the great reformer, is known to have said that suffering is in fact one of the distinguishing marks of the true church. Another pastor, and this is perhaps my favorite, said the great advantage of being thrown on your back is that you have no choice but to face heaven. So when the Spirit reigns in our lives and when the Spirit moves in our church, the result and the reminder to the church is to buckle up because Satan doesn't like it. Are you okay with that? See, make no mistake about it. What Acts chapter 4 reminds us is there are going to be storms. There are going to be trials. There are going to be persecutions. And in moments like this, will we stand? And will we fix our eyes to Jesus? We're reminded in Acts chapter 4 and all throughout Scripture, so it should come as no surprise that exactly what Jesus said would happen is exactly what happens in the face of the early church And it should not come as a surprise when it happens to us who follow Jesus even to this day. So we're going to dig into this passage a little bit further this morning. Let's go back to Acts chapter 4 and just read it again and see exactly what is happening in the text. It says, Now while they were speaking to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple of the police, and the Sadducees confronted them because they were annoyed. The emphasis could actually be put in stronger terms on that word annoyed. Because they were greatly annoyed that those people out there are teaching and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So immediately they seized them and took them into custody until the next day since it was already evening. In other words, you got Peter and John and the crippled man, which started about three in the afternoon, now going towards dusk. They arrest them and they throw them in to prison. But many of those who heard the message believed and the number of men came to about 5,000 on that day. I got to tell you, every time I read this passage, without fail, I just kind of smirk at that word, annoyed. The disciples, by the power of Jesus, had healed a guy who had been born crippled. And the people on the outside of the temple looked to Peter and to John, and they go, whoa, what just happened? We got to know by what power you did this. We got to know by what name you did this. And Peter and John, all throughout the end of Acts chapter 3, begin to explain to the people that it is only by the power of Jesus that this man who was crippled is now on his feet, but that even then, the greater miracle that Jesus desires to do is not just to bring crippled people back to their feet, but to bring dead people back to life. And it's a spiritual resurrection that he desires to do in them as they trust and turn from their sin and believe that Jesus is who he says he is. 
So the people had been asking throughout the past couple of hours after seeing the miracle performed by Peter and John, what on earth is going out? And then you got the religious leaders who, because of all the commotion, the priest and the police that are part of the temple guard, and, and then you got the Sadducees, they, they come out of this time of prayer, and there's such a great commotion that is going on that they're like, what on earth is going on? And they see the crippled man, and they hear the message that is being proclaimed by Peter and John, and their natural inclination was not. Like, praise God. Like, are you kidding me? Crippled man walking. A message that dead people, dead in their trespasses and sin, can come back to life. And the religious people of the day don't stop and go, praise God. It says, but while he was still speaking, in other words, while everyone was still hanging out, listening, in other words, while the crippled man is still walking and running and leaping and dancing and glorifying the Father of heaven, the priest and the temple police, as the text breaks it down, led by these people called Sadducees, come upon them they confront them. They express their great annoyance because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. And the question that we need to be asking ourselves is this. Why were the people here so greatly annoyed? And by the way, the question we need to be asking ourselves is this. Why are the people, when we so boldly proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the way, the truth, and the life, that nobody can come to the Father through, but through him, but that everybody can get to the Father through Jesus? Why are people so upset? Let's break it down a little bit further. See, I want you to note that the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees come together because of all the commotion. But it seems that it was the role of the Sadducees that is, is, are the leaders here in the incarceration of the disciples, Peter and John and the crippled man. And I want you to understand something. See, there's not a whole lot of nice things to say about this group of religious leaders. We could even put quote-unquote religious leaders there. When we look at the four Gospels and we think about the, the Sadducees, we naturally pair them with the Pharisees, but these are two different groups. It's not the Pharisees and Sadducees, one group, but it's the Pharisees and the Sadducees, two different groups. And so when we see and we talk about the Pharisees and their opposition to Jesus, they were opposed to Jesus based on religious reasons or theological reasons. They were opposed to Jesus, misguided as they were, because they were trying to do the right thing and live the right way. And Jesus begins to tell them, you can't do it on your own. And they were offended by that. But nonetheless, that's the point. That was the Pharisees. But the Sadducees' opposition to Jesus was largely one of political motivation. In fact, when we look at the four Gospels, what we actually find is that the Pharisees opposed Jesus much earlier in the Gospels. Because their opposition was theological. The Sadducees, only what Jesus has gathered a crowd, only once what Jesus is preaching has become a movement, do they go, wait, we got to figure something out. The Sadducees themselves rose to prominence about 160 years before Jesus in what was, what was known as the Maccabean Revolt. And they were a particular horrible bunch. Like I said, there's not a whole lot of good things that we can say about the Sadducees. They were basically known as the type of people who would sell their mother if it meant that they could stay in power. That's the kind of people we're talking about in this passage. And one of the reasons they stu struggled with Jesus so much is because they really didn't believe in a literal Messiah at all. And in fact, when we're talking about the Pharisees, we're talking about a group of people who waited, long awaited the Messiah, even though they missed him. But when we're talking about the Sadducees, what we're talking about is a group of people who really didn't believe in a literal Messiah. In other words, the Messianic age was a political age where the Sadducees themselves, because why wouldn't they be, be the prominent people in positions of power. That was what they desired. And so when Jesus comes along and begins to preach the kingdom of God is at hand, therefore repent and follow me, the Sadducees took great angst to that. 
Moreover, one of the important things that you need to know about the Sadducees is that they were essentially materialist. Our day might label these kind of people secular humanists. In other words, they believed you were born, you lived, you died, and nothing. They didn't believe in the resurrection. So when we read in Acts chapter 4 that you have this group of people that are greatly annoyed that they're talking about Jesus and teaching about the resurrection from the dead, this is why. Don't miss this. Check it out with me. In our day and time, have you ever wondered why people get so uptight, so annoyed, so offended, so aggressive when you start talking about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? I think the same reasoning for the Sadducees is the same reasoning for today. See, if Jesus rose from the grave, don't miss this. If Jesus rose from the grave, then Jesus is who he says he is. He is God in flesh. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can get to the Father but through him. If Jesus rose from the grave, he is who he says he is, which means he is worthy of my praise. He is worthy of my honor. He is worthy of my worship. And all of that might be okay. But I really think the reason that people get so greatly annoyed when you start talking about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is this. What all of that means is that if Jesus rose from the grave and he is God, then I must. Then you must. Then they must submit their lives in absolutely full obedience to him. See, if Jesus rose from the grave, it changes everything. That means he's God and I'm not. That means he's good and what he says about me is true. And what he says about me is that I'm a sinner. That I have rebelled against God. That I am an enemy of God. And because of my sin, I'm separated from God. And I cannot earn my way back to God on my own. It is only through Jesus that that can happen. Don't miss the rub. See, if Jesus rose from the grave, he is worthy of my obedience, and I must submit my life to him. And I think people still dislike that today. If Jesus rose from the grave, then he is the one that has the right to tell me how I must live because he is God who created me, and he's the only one who can save me. If Jesus rose from the grave, it changes absolutely everything, and people don't like change. And the Sadducees, like many people in our day today, were none too happy about this. Let's continue to check out the passage, what happens next. It says, The next day the rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem, along with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all the members of the high priestly family. And after they had Peter and John stand before them, they began to question them, and they asked this really seemingly innocent question that you're going to see is not so innocent in just a second. They say, by what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, by what means he was healed, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel. Peter doesn't back down, not one bit. He says, let it be known to all of you. As a matter of fact, the the Greek uses a little stronger word. He says, let it be known to all y'all. Everybody that's in within earshot needs to hear this. Let it be known That the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you and is healthy. This Jesus, the stone rejected by you, which has become the, the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, and there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. And when they observed the boldness, the great boldness of Peter and John, and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that these were men who had been with Jesus. 
So let me ask this question this first way. How do we respond in the face of spiritual activity? And the answer for us as people of faith is we stand firm. Check this out. Peter and John are arrested. They're thrown in the county jail overnight, and they're waiting on arraignment the next morning. As a matter of fact, they're thrown in jail not just by any people, but they're thrown in jail by the same people who had brought Jesus to prison and then crucified him the next day. You got that picture in your head? Right? It gets better. So you have the sophisticated, noble, elite Sadducees assemble. They are the educated bunch. And they gather in their robes together with smug looks on their faces, thinking this to themselves. We are about to teach these hick Galilean fishermen a lesson. We're going to put a stop to this uprising. And then you got Peter and John, along with this healed beggar. The beggar still wearing the filthy rags that he had worn the day before. By the way, he probably wore those rags the day before that, and the day before that, and the day before that, and the day before that. And here are the Sadducees circling around them, salivating over the opportunity to put them into their place. And you got Peter and John. And they waltz right in. And if people had called people redneck back in the day, they'd have called Peter and John rednecks. Peter and John were it. They were fishermen. They were farm boys. They're standing before this educated bunch of elite rulers. They were uneducated. They were simple-minded. They were never amount to anything people. And the Sadducees believed this was going to go their way. So they asked them this presumptuous, calculated, yet subtle question. By what power and by what name did you do this? Check this out, church. The question was subtle and calculated. I say that because if the apostles had attributed the healing power to any other name other than Yahweh, then their fate was sealed. They were doomed. Even though there was clear evidence of a real miracle, the verdict upon them would most certainly be death. And the question that Peter and John had to ask themselves is what should we do? And this is what they say. Let it be known to all of you and to all of the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, do you hear it? He says, we're not scared of you. We know Jesus is alive. We know Jesus is seated on his throne. We know that the name of Jesus saves. We know we have been sealed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, by him this man is standing here before you and is healthy. This stone, rejected by you builders, He's now the chief cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. And the Sadducees' jaws hit the floor. They didn't know what to do when these simple people held fast and stood firm in their faith. When these uneducated people weren't impressed by their setting or the power of the people sitting around them. When they didn't cower before their power, their education, or their position, Peter and John didn't back down. And church family, I want to make this abundantly clear that we as God's people are not called to be people who back down either. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 39 says, we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are those who have faith and are saved. So we say, spiritual activity breeds spiritual activity. When God is moving in my life and in my church, the evil one is going to rise up against it. What am I supposed to do? I am supposed to stand firm. How on earth can I stand firm in the face of such an assault? And it's this. Here's the crux of what I want you to get this morning. 
It is only by being people who have first been with Jesus. It wasn't Peter and John's high and lofty answers that blew the Sadducees away. Yeah, they recognized that they were uneducated men. They recognized that they were people that were not of prominence or power, or position, popularity, or prosperity. And all of that was secondary to what really shocked the Sadducees. They make special note of it in the text. And Luke records for us the thing that really shocked them. What really blew their mind as they looked at them is they recognized that these people, Peter and John, stood there and boldly proclaimed to them in the face of what could be certain death, the gospel of life, because they were people who had been with Jesus. How do we stand when trials come our way? And they will come our way. How do we stand when the evil one strikes? Oh, and if God is moving and we're pursuing him and we're sharing him, the evil one will strike. He will seek to deceive. He will seek to divide. He will seek to to destroy, and we must be people who stand. How do we stand in the face of persecution when people hurl insults at us? When people want us to back down and bow down? I want you to see that the same truth that was true for John and Peter is true for us today. For us, we don't physically walk and talk with Jesus But church family, we can draw near to him. We can draw near to him in prayer. We can draw near to him through his word. We can draw near to him in the fellowship and life groups. We can draw near to him as we worship together. Outside of this, when persecution or trials of any kind come our way, we will crumble. We will be divided. And we will be destroyed. The good news is this, that inside of this, having drawn near to Jesus, because as Tim said, we don't fight for victory, we fight from it. We can withstand any storm. Because we know that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the grave, we can withstand any trial. Because we know the one who has forgiven us and is now seated at the right hand of God with all authority on heaven and earth given to him, we can withstand any persecution. Because we have trusted Jesus, because we have drawn near to Jesus, we could be people that even in the face of death are people who still stand. Let me ask you this in our time of invitation this morning. If a great trial or overwhelming persecution were to come your way today, are you confident in your ability to stand? For some here this morning, you might recognize that you couldn't stand. As a matter of fact, in the face of great trial, in the face of great loss, in the face of great persecution, just the mere thought of it has you quaking in your boots, and I want you to hear that's okay. Because you don't have to stay in those boots. I want you to hear that Jesus died for you to forgive all of your sin and that you can trust him, that he will hold tight to you, that your eternity can be secure, your salvation can be sure if you will trust in Jesus. You don't have to fear what is to come. For others in the room this morning, you've trusted in Jesus, but you recognize your relationship with Jesus is not where it ought to be. Maybe it's your participation in the body of Christ, your hit or miss. Maybe it's your personal devotion to prayer and to God's word. It's not there. Maybe it's that you're not surrounded with the fellowship of believers who can pray for you, encourage you, spur you on to love and good works. We have a thing called life groups. You need to be in one. We can help you get there. For whatever reason, you realize that if trial came your way, 
if persecution was inflicted on you and stood you, staring you in the eyes, your knees would buckle because you have not first drawn near to Jesus. For you this morning, I want you to know the altars are open. Maybe you need to pray that God would grow your desire to draw near to him. For others still, you've been drawing near to Jesus and yet you've been lacking in boldness to share this about his salvation with those who are around you. Maybe you just need to come and pray for boldness or pray for a lost person that God has been placing on your heart an opportunity for you to boldly declare that Jesus saves. However God is leading you this morning, I want to invite you to respond. I want to invite some friends up here. They'd love to pray with you this morning. I'll be up here. I'd love to pray with you this morning. However God's leading your heart, let's pray and then we'll respond. Father God, thank you.